Today we talk about unexplained infertility. I'm Dr. Mark Amos, and this is Taco About Fertility Tuesday. Maybe you've been trying for a year, maybe longer, but now you decide to go to the fertility doctor and get evaluated. And they do all the tests, testing your tubes, testing the sperm, looking at the uterus, checking your ovarian reserve, and you come back for your follow-up. And most likely you're excited. You should be. And here it is, you've come to the doctor without getting pregnant for quite a period of time, and now you're going to get some answers. But then unfortunately, the doctor gives you the diagnosis of unexplained infertility. Now at first you may be thinking, great, even my doctor doesn't know what's wrong. Or maybe you're thinking, I'm so messed up that they can't even find a problem now. But that's actually not true. Unexplained infertility is not idiopathic issues. The word idiopathic is what we use when we don't have a cause. So for example, if your partner had problems with his sperm, and we verified that there are low sperm numbers or low motility, but we can't find a cause for that, we call that an idiopathic cause, meaning we don't have an actual reason. However, when we do testing for fertility and we don't find a cause, that isn't idiopathic. It's unexplained, not because it can't be explained, but more because We just don't have the test to test everything. And even more so, people would have to spend more than it costs to do IVF to find out. Unexplained infertility is not an uncommon diagnosis. Matter of fact, 25% of patients who come to see the doctor will likely get diagnosed with unexplained infertility. The exact definition of unexplained infertility is when we look at things like ovulating factors, ovarian quality, fallopian tubes, looking at the uterus, looking at the sperm, looking at the hormones, if everything comes back normal, then at that point we don't have a reason to explain the infertility. But like I said, it doesn't mean there can't be other causes. For example, there are things like endometriosis. Endometriosis is when the inside tissue, the endometrium, grows on the outside of the uterus, and that itself can cause infertility. There's also egg quality issues, where some people may have poor quality eggs, and there's almost no way to verify that with testing. There's also things like tubal factors, such as the tubes may not be working. There's also issues where the sperm may not be able to penetrate the egg. There could even be cervical issues. There could even be sperm issues. And so we're going to take the time to go into each one of these so we can talk about what unexplained infertility really is. And the good thing is there are options and the options are very good. So let's start first with endometriosis. I think this is one of the things most women worry they have when they have unexplained infertility. Now, if you don't have severe painful periods, or pain with intercourse, it's unlikely you have endometriosis, but you still could. Now, the only way to diagnose this is with a laparoscopy, where we put a camera in your belly. And most doctors aren't going to do that just to go looking for something, but it's something we think about. The second area I would think about is there could there be a tubal dysfunction. Now, clearly, if you did a tubal test, it's going to show if your tubes are open or closed. But the tubes do more than just stay open or closed. They actually have function. The little fimbriae, the little fingers of the tube, pull the eggs to the tube. And so if those fingers are damaged, for some reason are not working, then there is no way you're going to get pregnant without IVF. The next area we talked about is the sperm. Even though the sperm may look good, that doesn't mean the sperm's going to work well on game day. We see this all the time in in any field where something looks like it should be good, 
But then when it comes to real world, it doesn't. I see this in sports all the time. There's a player who everyone thinks is going to be one of the best players in the world. And then they end up being the bust. Now, why is that? Because when we look at certain factors and we say they may be good, we're basing that off of associations between factors and then how real world will be. And the thing is, it's not perfect. If it was, there wouldn't be a person named Ryan Leaf or a person named Greg Oden, who are two big busts in the NFL and NBA respectively. Now, when we're talking about sperm, the parameters we're looking at just mean if these parameters are good, then it's associated with working. But that doesn't mean it's always going to work. The same assumption can occur with sperm shape. We assume if the sperm shape is normal, that the sperm should be able to penetrate an egg. But we know that's not always true. There are times sperm cannot penetrate an egg, and the only way to find that out is at IVF, when we see that the sperm do not penetrate the egg. Egg quality is very similar, because when we check egg quality, we're associating that people who usually are younger have better ovarian reserve numbers. And people who are older have poor ovarian reserve numbers. So when we find someone who's younger and we see the ovarian reserve is lower, we make the assumption that it may affect the egg quality. On the same token, when we see things look good, we say, well, then that's what people who are younger have. They must be good. However, I remind people, this isn't always true. You can see a gentleman in a tie and go, wow, that guy's an outstanding person. I'm sure he doesn't commit crimes. And he could be Dexter the serial killer. So the point is, you can't always go by data if it's not causative because association data isn't always 100% correlated. Another undiscovered area could be the endometrium. There could be timing issues where for some reason, whenever you're trying to implant, the timing is wrong. And so sometimes we figure this out in IVF. I actually have a couple who is very young over many, many years, could never get pregnant. And we thought the issue was ovulation. And then even after fixing ovulation and doing IUIs, they never got pregnant. So we went and did IVF. And again, putting back embryos, they would not get pregnant. And then we did an ERA, which is an endometrial receptivity analysis. And we found out that she needed to transfer the embryo almost 24 hours earlier than would have been expected. Now, if you think about it naturally, how would an embryo fall into the uterus on the third or fourth day, when normally it's not falling until the fifth day? And so here's a situation where I think the reason they weren't getting pregnant is there's something wrong with the timing in their body, and that because of the advancements we have with IVF and the ERA, we're able to fix it and get pregnant without issues. The last and probably the most common thought we think of when people have unexplained infertility is cervical issues. And essentially what we're talking about cervical issues are one of a couple things. The first is going to be, is there a possibility sperm antibodies, where the cervical mucus has antibodies in it that's causing the sperm to glutinate together and not be able to swim well? Think of this kind of like a three-legged race. You can run fast, but when you have another person attach you, you don't run as well. Same thing with sperm. If they're stuck with antibodies, they may not be able to swim as well. The other question that comes up is, could there be a hostile environment? Meaning, the vaginal environment is not supposed to be a friendly environment. It's supposed to prevent bacteria and other things from getting in. So, sometimes there might be some people who don't work as well together and that maybe attacks more of his sperm. Maybe his sperm looks a little bit tougher, but really it isn't when it's in that vaginal environment. So, we call those cervical factors and I think you could even take sperm parameters that are just okay, maybe they have a hard time getting through the cervix. And so what the first treatment in unexplained infertility usually is, is going to be doing what are called artificial inseminations, also known as IUIs, intrauterine inseminations. The thought process behind the IUI is that you are bypassing the cervix. So if there are sperm antibodies, if there is issues with sperm parameters, if there is something going on with the environment of the vaginal environment, then you're bypassing it by doing the IUI. You're shooting the sperm into the uterus. If it's a mild sperm issue and it's unrecognized, now you're putting millions of sperm into the uterus. 
Whereas before, naturally, when you have intercourse, most of the sperm never gets into the uterus. Matter of fact, only about 100,000 to 200,000 sperm get into the uterus naturally. So you can see, by putting millions in, you're already improving things numerically. Now, one of the questions that comes up is, can't we just try Clomid or Famara and try on our own? And the answer is sure, but you're probably not going to improve your chances. Because if you have unexplained infertility, then it means you don't have an ovulation issue. And if you don't have an ovulation issue and you're ovulating every month on your own, why would Clomid or Famara help you? And what I mean by that is Clomid and Famara make you release a second egg. So if your issue is an egg quality issue and you released 12 eggs over the last year, why would you get pregnant by releasing a second egg? And the answer is you probably won't because most people after three months, 50% of people are pregnant. So if you've been trying for a year, the issue is not just having another egg. Now, that being said, although I would not recommend ovulation induction with timed intercourse for unexplained infertility, we would still give something like Clomid or Fumar or even a stronger treatment when doing artificial inseminations. Now the question is, well, didn't I just say it wouldn't help you? Well, no, what I'm saying is it won't help you alone. But if you're doing the IUI, it would benefit us because we could make more eggs and improve your chances per cycle. And what I do is I tend to pick the protocol based off of the prognosis. So for someone who's young, let's say 22 years old, and been trying one year, I may just do Fumara or Clomid because that's really all they need. But if I have someone who's 40, who's been trying for six years, and we're going to do IUIs, I'm going to be aggressive. I'm probably going to try to make three, four eggs because I know they've had six years of trying. Trying Clomid or Fumara, it's a drop in the bucket. I'm not even really trying to get them pregnant in that situation. The real question is, will the IUI work? This is a difficult question to answer because it's one going to depend on the prognosis of the patient. It's going to depend on the age of the patient, how long they've been trying for. So there is a lot of factors that can say if it can work. Now, generally what I do is if someone is young and they haven't tried for more than three years, I will usually start with IUIs as the first line treatment for unexplained infertility. But it's important to understand that this can only fix the cervical issues, and the mild sperm issues. If the issue is due to a tubal function issue, if the issue is due to a sperm penetration issue, then this is probably not going to help. Now, yes, if there is endometriosis that's mild or an egg quality issue, making more eggs may help. But the point is, if it is those other two factors where the tubes are not working functionally or the sperm cannot penetrate the egg, No IUI is going to work in these situations. Now, traditionally, most people will do IUIs approximately three times. And if you're not pregnant by the third time, they're going to recommend to either go into IVF or do more testing. So at that point, you're looking at things like endometriosis doing a laparoscopy. But it's not unfair to ask the question, should you go straight to IVF? Now, I think this should depend on a lot of factors, but let's just talk about this from the time span of how long you've been trying. I traditionally, if you've been trying for at least three to five years or more, I will usually recommend going to IUI first for unexplained infertility. And the reason why is I have found, at least in my practice, that whenever we do IUIs for unexplained infertility and the person has only been trying for less than three years, approximately 50% of my patients will get pregnant. However, when I have patients who have been trying for over three years, or especially over five years, is less than 20% of the people who will get pregnant with IUIs. So for some people, it is worth just skipping onto IVF. It would be more affordable, and it would also be less stressful. However, there are people who have coverage for IUIs. For them, I'd say, why not? It's not going to hurt anything. You might as well try it. But if people have been trying for a long time, or if their financial situation would limit them to only doing one treatment, I would say if you're close to three years of trying and you haven't had success and it's unexplained, IVF may be the better route. And you just think about it. I mean, three years of trying, 36 eggs being released. Everybody else, by three eggs, over 50% of people are pregnant naturally. 
but you've released 36 that haven't got pregnant. What magic is going to happen from putting sperm through the cervix? I mean, again, unless you have those antibodies, unless you have the most hostile vagina on earth, it's very unlikely it's going to work. And so for that reason, I recommend going straight to IVF. Hopefully, you can see that there are many options still available. Matter of fact, most of my patients with unexplained infertility do get pregnant unless something severe came back, which by definition wouldn't be unexplained infertility. At that point, we would say, oh, we figured out what's wrong. This is the issue. But in the end, most people with unexplained infertility are going to get pregnant. And that's the good news. The hard part is trying to determine, do you go on to the low-tech treatments first or do you go on to the more aggressive treatments first? But the good news is, it's probably going to work. And even though you won't know what was wrong, you're going to be happy to have that baby in your arms. I hope this podcast was helpful to the 25% of you who were diagnosed with unexplained infertility. Again, it's not that there isn't a diagnosis. It's just that we don't always have the test to find out. But the good news is, there's treatment and you're going to be pregnant eventually. As always, if you ever have questions about anything we talk about, please feel free to email me at tbft at newdirectionfertility.com. That's TBFT like in Taco Bout Fertility Tuesday at NewDirectionFertility.com. And I'm more than happy to answer those questions about the things in our show. I also really appreciate everyone has told people about our show. We have a, have a lot of subscribers and we really appreciate the reviews anytime anyone can give them. I look forward to talking to you guys again. I think I might be able to do these weekly again since uh, the state is opening up and my family's finally able to get out of the house. Until next week, this is Talk About Fertility Tuesday.